This episode is brought to you by BitMEX, the OG crypto exchange that is back and better than ever. You'll hear more about BitMEX later in the show. All right, everyone, back with a uh, special episode of Empire. I'm joined today not by Santiago, but by my co-founder, Mike Ippolito, and also a very special guest, Olaf Carlson, we CEO and founder of Polychain Capital. Olaf, welcome to Empire. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Of course. You didn't you didn't introduce me as a B squad this time. Jason, so already I'm leveling up since the last episode. I know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. B squad is back. So Olaf, we're excited to have you, man. This is a, a crazy, crazy, crazy time in crypto. So we're excited that you were able to uh, make time to jump on here. Um, I just wanted to actually start pretty high level and just get your framework for how you're viewing things, right? Terra um, is seems to kind of be falling apart, right? The peg on UST broke. It went down from a dollar down to 30 cents. It's back up to 68 cents at the time of recording. Luna has fallen from like 84 bucks down to like two or three dollars. Bitcoin's down to 30K. Um, and a lot of things are, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80% off the highs. So maybe we can just start broad. And I'd ask you like, what is, you've been through so many cycles, like what is your framework for how you're viewing the markets right now? Yeah, so um, as a backdrop, I mean, um, I went through the 20, 2011 crash, um, the the 2014 crash, the 2018 crash, and and now I think I can safely say like the the 2022 crash. So you know, I just think crypto is highly cyc cyclical. Um, it it kind of always has been, obviously, I guess. Um, and you know what happens is there's this sort of um, there's this thing that happens in crypto with newcomers, especially where new people always find out about crypto during one of these like uh, market cycles. And it's during the high points in the cycle. So I got into crypto basically at the exact peak of the 2011, um, you know, run up. And I think if you ask everyone in crypto, I would say 90% of people found out during basically the exact peak of one of these market cycles. Um, so it's it's this weird way that crypto sort of spreads um, into new users. Um, but then the real sort of actual process of building things in crypto, you know, I think it generally happens in a more focused, um, you know, and pragmatic way when markets are low and there's not like this flood of new people coming in. Um, basically, the macro growth slows down and then it's up to actual entrepreneurs and engineers and builders to like create useful products and services um, rather than there being such a strong macro tailwind that everybody can just sort of um, ride the wave, so to speak. Um, so I actually think it's, you know, sometimes I wish it wasn't so crazy um, in crypto, like the way that it, it really goes up quite a bit and down quite a bit. But I do think it's it's sort of healthy, the cyclical nature of crypto, because it helps people um, just sort of, you know, it, it really helps like a lot of capital come into the space and a lot of new people come into the space. Um, and, you know, so you get this kind of sci-fi moment where it feels like anything is possible. Um, and then, you know, you can sort of use those those new users and that new capital to actually build useful products um, during the bear markets. And it's during those bear markets that everything important has ever been developed. You know, I would say bear market one, um, Coinbase was founded, 2012. Uh, bear market two, um, 2015, Ethereum launched. Um, bear market three, 2018-19 is when the beginnings of uh, both DeFi and NFTs um, sort of launched. So I, I just think that um, I'm very excited to see what the big, you know, important thing that comes out of this uh, bear market is. And that's mostly what I'm going to spend my time on is trying to figure out um, what's the next sort of macro trend that will drive, um, you know, um, um, drive the, the next narrative um, and drive the kind of next wave of new users, like what will inspire them to get into crypto. Um, now that said, you know, I, for people whose first time it is going through one of these market cycles, it's probably pretty scary. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have a lot of, um, a lot to say other than, you know, you just have to deal with it. Like there's, I don't think there's a really simple like way to, to navigate it. It's just like, just take comfort in that, you know, 
you know, I've been a professional crypto investor for years, but the, the first investment I ever made in crypto, I like lost over 90% on instantly, basically, um, which was Bitcoin in 2011. So, um, you know, it's, I think it happens to everybody when they first get into yeah. crypto. Olaf, let me ask you this. There are cycles in every industry, right? I'm reading this book about Rockefeller right now, and it's talking about um, the oil the oil cycles and it moved in a very actually similar manner to crypto and um, uh, laying the railroads in America moved in a very cyclical manner. The tech, um, everyone points to kind of like the similarities between crypto and the dot-com bubble, but it does feel like crypto moves in these uh, very intensified cycles that happen very quickly. It's not like a decade long cycle. It's maybe a 18 month or a two year or three year cycle. Um, and so I'm curious to get your take on why, like what, what, what does cause these very intensified cycles? And is this something that you see eventually slowing down is the intensification of these cycles, or this is just something that's inherently just in the nature of crypto? I think that because crypto is such a brand new category, um, and it's it sort of rejects so many, um, you know, of the archetypes of the old system, both from a financial and a technology perspective. That um, it just means the product development and technology development is is really fast and very hard to predict. Um, so the the way that crypto has sort of um, blown up, you know, and like the number of users that have come in and the number of new products. Um, and new technologies that have been developed, it's really fast. Like it's it's very, very hard to keep up with. Um, everybody who's in crypto knows that. It's just sort of like the number of kind of fringe crypto projects is at this point uncountable. It's actually crazy when, when I truly really try to grasp in my head all at once how many like weird little crypto projects are out there. Um, it's kind of like trying to keep track of every weird little website, right? Um, in the early days of the internet, right? It, it's, it's financial in a lot of ways. So it's, um, it's a little bit different, right? Than just, just those websites, but that's really like the scope of the entrepreneurial experiment here. It's like, we're all going to make websites. One of them will turn out to be amazon.com. Um, but like literally anybody can make a website, right? Um, so I do think, you know, because of that, um, like massive entrepreneurial laboratory, there's just a lot of chaos, um, but also it means things move really quickly, um, if a bit savagely. Like there's lots and lots of failures in order to get those one thing, one or two things that really, really work and, and move the whole thing forward. Um, so because of that whole kind of entrepreneurial laboratory, it, I just think the whole thing moves fast. And that means new things get developed very quickly. And so then these rises and falls of, of interest happen very quickly. It's, it's like with the um, invention of, of ICOs and crowdfunding, you sort of saw this incredible wave of interest um, in, in 2017. Um, and then, you know, it turned out that was sort of incomplete and really just a component of this larger concept of DeFi that really had some some real legs to it and really feels like um, it is going to be long term the, the sort of substrate of the global financial system. So I, I think that um, there's also this this dichotomy, I think, oftentimes with young crypto projects between like this will radically transform the entire world um, and like we have 100 users, right? Um, and it's like, you can see it, right? Um, it, this is, but like, it, it's sort of hard to then price such a thing, right? Um, I think this is how I felt about Bitcoin um, when I first found out about it. It was like, wow, this is like, you know, this is going to actually replace, um, you know, state backed money. Like it's, it's the craziest, it's such a huge um, concept. It's way beyond technology. It's like a, it's a social phenomenon. Um, but at the same time, like I'm on Mt. Gox, you know, doing this janky um, stuff to try to buy it. And like, you know, it's just not there yet, right? And so then it, it's really hard to price that thing. And it makes sense to me that you can see this future, but the reality is, is pretty bleak at the, in the moment. And then it's very volatile. Um, because you're kind of tracking from A to B. Um, so yeah, I, I do think um, 
all of these add up to why crypto is like so crazy. And then on top of that, a lot of people are using leverage, which just, you know, I would, I broadly would not recommend for the average person, but a lot of people use leverage. And so ever all of the stuff I'm talking about that's sort of fundamental just gets, um, it gets worse with leverage. I, I have a question for you, Olaf, uh, just having lived through many of these particular cycles in crypto yourself. So I get your emotional advice is that people just need to deal with it. <laughs> uh, but like, what are some patterns that you might have noticed, right? Having lived through these cycles in the past, right? Because in there's always a, a narrative that accompanies the fall in price. So and, and there are, usually are external events like in 2014, it was or it was Mt. Gox, right, that broke. Um, in 2017 to 2018, it was kind of the unwinding of the ICO bubble. During this particular one, you know, people are very focused on, and I want to lead into kind of UST and everything that's going on there, but people are very focused on the macro, right, and everything that's going on with the interest rate environment, and then we've just kind of had a stable coin blow up on us. So I guess just having lived through many of these in the past, what are some kind of s repeated patterns that you've no noticed going through these market cycles, and then specifically things that you might be on the lookout for, for like, all right, this feels like a bottom or as low as we're going to go or, or just things of that nature. Yeah. Um, I mean, these, you know, it, it is interesting how um, there's like these, there's like these single project events that blow up that sometimes feel like they're accompanying just like the larger market cycle. Um, mm. If I had to place them, it'd, it'd probably be, um, it'd probably be like Mt. Gox, um, maybe BitConnect um, mm. or something. Um, and then, you know, now it just feels like it's it's definitely um, this this DPEG of, of UST and the accompanying fallout of Luna and the ecosystem there. I mean, it's – there's – part of the reason is a lot of systems in crypto um, at a base level – have leverage sort of embedded inside them. Um, in the case of Mt. Gox, this was, um, you know, the Willy bot um, and basically the insolvency of the platform. So it was, you know, artificially buying a lot more than the actual demand in the market. Um, that works just fine as long as the price keeps going up forever. Um, like nobody will notice Willy bot um, exists. But then once the price turns the other way, all of a sudden, you know, you will recognize that this is this is a problem. And Olaf, the will, the Willy bot. For those who don't know, this was the was this an automated trading? Yes, that was happening on Mount. Um, so <laughs> it's a little unclear exactly who built it. I think, but broadly, um, some you know somebody, I you know, and I don't want to point fingers. I have no idea really what was happening. But there was an account at Mount Gox that was generated by an administrator. It was automated. And it purchased a ton of Bitcoin like every two minutes or something. You know, it was just very regularly bidding the order book very heavily. Um, but there wasn't like real money in the account. Um, you know, actually, it was just sort of a database entry that this account had a ton of money in it. Um, so it was bidding up the price in the order book, but there wasn't like, you know, it became like fractional reserve. There wasn't actually money there um, to, to pay for it. So you look at the – and Mt. Gox at the time was like 80% of the trade volume in, in all of Bitcoin. And there was no other coin really. <laughs> there was just Bitcoin. So um, Willy Bot like drove the price up very dramatically. Um, and then when it unwound the other way um, and Mt. Gox came out as insolvent and everything, it obviously unwound um, very aggressively. So, you know, I think that when you look at um, UST – and the depegging, um, there's similarly a, a kind of leverage mechanism in that a lot of these um, seniorage or algorithmic or partially collateralized um, stablecoin um, designs, you know, they do have an element of like a confidence game that's kind of a game theoretical um, prisoner's dilemma a little bit, where if we can sort of all agree um, to play the game a certain way, it's a stable system. Um, but you know, you have these outside factors that can cause people to sort of start to question that equilibrium and like sort of run for the, the door. And it's kind of a bank run situation. Um, and because it's only partially collateralized, um, you know, there isn't like a, 
a base there in the same way that these fully collateralized projects um, have that kind of full collateral base. And so that, you know, on the way up, you see a lot of um, positive feedback loops, you know, driving the price up. Um, and that leads to larger UST issuance. That leads to more people speculating on the underlying um, Luna. That leads to, um, you know, more and more ability to pay out um, returns in, in Anchor. Like it's all this positive feedback loop that just keeps working as long as the, the price is going up. Um, but then once we see price drops, like it, the unwind is as dramatic, right? Because you have these feedback loops and leverage kind of hidden in the system. And you see that all unwind the other way. So people want to run for the door with their UST. You know, it causes the price of, of Luna to drop. Um, you know, it's just all the mechanisms that make it work, make it break too. Um, and we, we saw of similar unwinds, you know, that were pretty intense. I mean, the, you know, the, when I was looking at um, revenue or like, you know, protocol level earnings by Axie Infinity, um, you know, I think top tick to bottom tick, it's dropped by like over 99%, um, which is pretty dramatic. You know, it's just, but it's the way this works where if you put in this system where, you know, um, the price going up leads to all these people playing the game and, and mining. Um, and then, you know, people buy the coin because the, the number of people playing the game is going up. You know, you're kind of getting the causality wrong when you're betting that way. It's like buying Bitcoin because the hash rate is going up. Um, it's like it doesn't make sense. Um, and then, you know, when it goes the other way, people get you know, it gets unwound the other way. So not only is the price dropping, but all the players are logging off too. And so that makes people want to sell and the price is dropping more, players log off more. It's like this um, reflexive, um, yeah, relationship. Olaf, maybe this is where we can kind of get into the weeds a little bit on just this whole situation that's going on with Luna and UST. So you're kind of just talking about these systems that have virtuous cycles on the way up and then maybe the opposite occur on the way down. Can you just walk folks who might not be familiar with what exactly is the relation, like what is UST, what's the relationship with Luna and what happened right now? Like why have we seen a depegging? Yep. So, um, okay, so it's, it's sort of a complex system. Um, but it's useful to just understand sort of the theory behind um, different stablecoin mechanisms. Um, you know, the, there's kind of three, I would say, broad-based categories um, of stablecoins. One is where it, there's collateral, but the collateral is not on the blockchain. Um, so this is like um, USDC. This is Tether. Um, this is where the collateral is held in, by some central entity off the system. Um, and then you can, you know, redeem, you know, the, the stable coin that's on the blockchain for cash that's sort of just in a bank account off the blockchain. Um, so those systems are, you know, relatively simple conceptually. The problem is, of course, that there's kind of a central entity that, that controls all that collateral. Uh, the second type is where the collateral is actually held on the blockchain. This is what the MakerDAO system does. So it's fully collateralized stable coin but all the collateral can be visualized and seen on the blockchain and it's not controlled by a central entity. So it's decentralized um, in the sense that there's not one single entity that, you know, in theory could freeze the collateral or, or seize the collateral or something like that. Um, but it's a trickier system to reason about. It's just a little bit more um, complex. Um, and, you know, it's, it's harder to build, it's harder to scale, but it's, it's, it's a lot more resilient. Um, than the, the first type. Then there's kind of a, a third type that people generally refer to as seniorage or, or algorithmic stable coins. And um, this is where, you know, the peg is, is backed up. Um, so there's this, the stable coin itself, and then there's a secondary asset that um, sort of represents like an interest in um, the stable coin system, sort of. And it kind of acts as collateral of last resort um, for that stable coin. Um, it's important for the market cap of that collateral to stay above um, the market cap of the stable coin. 
Um, and the idea here is you can always redeem the stable coin for $1 worth of the underlying. Um, and you can um, redeem the underlying for um, $1 of the stable coin. And so in that way, if the stable coin ever goes above a dollar or below a dollar, you have arbitragers that, um, you know, do this collateral exchange and can make a profit. And the further it goes off peg, the larger those arbitragers stand to earn. So if it, if it goes off the peg by 1%, you know, an arbitrager can earn 1%. If it goes off um, by 99%, an arbitrager, in theory, if it gets back to the peg, stands to make a 100x return, right? So you, you kind of increase um, um, reward as the peg becomes um, undone and you're increasing risk in a sense for the arbitragers. Um, what's tricky about this system um, and in the case of, of Terra Luna is that the, the collateral is, is highly correlated with the, the you know, success of the stable coin. So in the case of a system like MakerDAO, um, DAI has lots of different collateral assets. Um, it, they're all crypto, so they're all broadly correlated on, on some level, but they're not, you know, it doesn't have um, MKR, like the maker token, as the collateral in the system. Um, you know, so one way to view Terra Luna is it, it's sort of like the Luna token really only exists in, in a way to act as collateral or, or seniorage shares, whatever you want to call it, um, for that UST stablecoin. So, you know, what we found out here is that the, the problem is that when that those two assets are correlated, like as the peg gets undone, people lose faith in the system. And so the price of Luna drops. And as the price of Luna drops, it becomes harder and harder to use that collateral to restore the peg. And it's like a confidence loop. Um, so, you know, it's it because the two assets are correlated um, and you really depend on, you know, Luna retaining value in order for UST to to um, be sort of backed or, or collateralized. Um, you just see this feedback loop where as people lose confidence, um, you know, in one, they lose confidence in the other. And so, you know, if these two things were sort of uncorrelated, you know, it might have a better chance of working. Um, in this case, you know, there's like not enough Luna in a sense to redeem um, for UST. Um, and then, you know, in that case, like the UST isn't really backed. Now, on top of all this mechanism I'm talking about, which is sort of the algorithmic stablecoin mechanism, there's also a foundation um, collecting, you know, tens of thousands of Bitcoin to back the system. So it's sort of like partially algorithmic and like partially offline collateralized, sort of in a USDC or, or Tether style capacity. Um, but the, the problem is that that offline collateral, you know, wasn't, I mean, I don't think it is significant enough here to backstop the entire system. So you have this kind of partial collateralization and then you have this uh, algorithmic um, backing, but you know, neither of them is sort of big enough here. So, I mean, it's, and just to timestamp this, I mean, it's, it's May 11th in the morning. So, you know, I, this is very much like happening right now um, I, I don't want to talk like it's it's 100% done, but um, you know it does feel like these these unwind um, has these kind of irreversible confidence game um, effects at play. So just to ask the question, then um, it may be a little bit of a two parter, but you know for Luna Terra, do you see that confidence ever getting restored in that in this particular stablecoin? And the you know the other the follow up to that is. You, know, you kind of have these voices coming out on Twitter. And to be fair, people did say this for a long time, right? And people have actually been making this argument even before uh, Terra Luna, right? When there was basis back in 2018 or whatever, that a seniorage model is simply impossible. We're not solving a technical problem. You're solving a, a you know, collective behavior problem. And it's just the seniorage model just doesn't work. Uh, so my question to you is, A, 
is this kind of curtains for for Terra Luna? And then B, on a on a higher level, do you think that the seniorage model for a stable coin can work, or is it just a flawed design uh, from the start? Um, you know, I've always been fascinated by this category. Um, you know, I was a seed investor um, in um, Basis, which you mentioned, um, and I was a seed investor in Terra as well, um, way back in 2018. Um, so, you know, I've always been fascinated by the concept, but I think empirically it doesn't look like it's working. Uh, so I, I don't have a strong um, stance on like, in theory, could it ever work? Um, to your question of, of, you know, this particular project, um, I, you know, I don't think that it, it, it can work. Like it just, I mean, Terra is down 99% in value mm. um, from the peak to now. And so that's, I think it's too much. Like they, I don't, you know, there's the, like I said, there's these confidence feedback loops that kind of um, either take it back, you know, um, up or it kind of unwinds all the way. And it's a, you know, it's maybe not completely, completely over, but like, I, I think we can effectively say like the unwind is, is done. Olaf, does the, does this unwind make you lose faith in decentralized algo stables as a concept? Or do you just kind of think, okay, next up we have Frax and maybe Frax works, but if Frax, Frax doesn't work, we have another thing. And then there's yeah. another thing. And I mean, in, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by the concept for sure. Um, you know, I, in a way the, maybe the U S dollar is like the ultimate algo stable that hasn't collapsed yet. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so. well, well, that, and maybe that's because you don't, the U S dollars not, doesn't have to be tied to anything and just pegging something to something else is a really, really hard, maybe even impossible. Yeah. Idea. But then you get into this, like, you know, if we're going to just create assets that aren't pegged and are speculative, why like have backing at all? Um, which is, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're not like backed by some other asset. Um, and it's it's in a way sort of ironic that it's safer to create an asset that is you know backed by nothing than an asset that's like sort of backed. Um, it's it's kind of like NFTs. It's like when NFTs have no utility, it's just about the art. But when there's utility, it's like, well, how what is this thing actually giving me? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's kind of weird, but um, empirically in crypto, it's been more effective to create a thing that, um, you know, is not tied to any other value, has no collateral, has no revenue, et cetera. Um, that's been sort of the safer approach. So if you can't create decentralized stables? Well, the algo, algo stables, MakerDAO is, is, is functioning um, as a fully collateralized. And I think that approach, um, the, the really the question there is how uh, much, how many different types of collateral can we use as um, backing? So, you know, a big experiment that will happen over time is, you know, can we, you know, include lots and lots and lots of different on-chain assets as collateral? Um, and then the, the big experiment is, can we include, you know, off-chain assets as collateral? Um, for a MakerDAO style system. So like if, if MakerDAO included like a factory or real estate or some, you know, tangible asset um, that's kind of not endogenous to the blockchain, can we have that as backing in, in a MakerDAO style system? And you run into some really complex stuff with, you know, like who represents that DAO and like if that collateral you know, goes bad, like how is it legally seized and, and, and liquidated and everything. Um, and it gets very tricky because you can't just write a smart contract to do all that stuff. Um, yeah. So I think we're, we're, we haven't yet seen where the edges or the limit are with that collateralized model either. But I think it's, it's pretty clear to me at this point that on-chain collateral um, in theory like should work. And, and I think it has worked so far. Um, I think the main question is what kind of scale can we get? Uh, well, maybe just to wrap this part up, then I want to kind of move into 
stuff you're excited about, right? And ask you some questions um, about like the future uh, of crypto. But um, you know, one thing that I think a lot of folks are asking, right, is if we're officially drawing the comparison between right now, the current time, 2022 and 2017 and 2014 and 2013 and 2011, there were some pretty vicious, there's a pretty vicious bear market of about two years where things were pretty bleak. Um, so I guess my you know, open question to you here is, do you see this time as being similar? Like, are we, is your kind of base case that we head into something that looks like a, um, you know, like a two year bear market or, you know, because of something like permanent capital or because we're just much further along and much more developed than we were in the past, do you see it being maybe more moderate? I'm just curious how you think about the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a strong view on how, um, how long it lasts. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean, we're, we're in the bear market. It's, it's not like a forward looking thing at this point. Um, you know, I do think also that crypto got big enough that it's tied to global macro now. Um, and we obviously saw, you know, tech stocks and all this kind of growth private equity crash. Um, and you can see that playing out in crypto. I mean, the, you know, the last private round of, um, OpenSea is equivalent to the liquid public market cap of Coinbase. Like the last private round of FTX was like double the liquid market cap of Coinbase. I think, you know, I'm excited about those businesses, but I do think that's a little um, crazy, right? To think about relative valuation. Um, so I, I think that um, we're gonna feel it in crypto um, as well, just like that bigger macro backdrop. But it's, it's interesting because all the previous cycles in crypto, nobody was like talking about interest rates for the stock market. Um, it just is, it didn't matter. And it's because crypto was such like a Petri dish. It was so small that, um, you know, these, these outside factors like never mattered. Um, now I think there is, you know, it's just big enough that like capital markets in general affect crypto. Um, but you know, I, I think I don't have a strong view on, on how long this lasts. Um, it, it's, it's more so up to the entrepreneurs and builders in crypto to continue to develop um, useful applications that people want to use. Um, I mean, it's in my mind, like the, the scariest bear market still for me was for sure the 2014, 15. Um, and it's because it was just really unclear like what the path forward was um you know there just wasn't that much happening um and we were trying to figure out you know use cases for bitcoin um outside of trading and speculation um which is of course a very useful use case but it's it's sort of maybe not for everyone um i remember like having these meetings in 2015 trying to figure out what was going to happen and like nobody having very good ideas. And then Ethereum- <laughs> like, like, uh, like enterprise blockchain, Olaf? <laughs> oh man, yeah. I mean, whenever you see enterprise blockchain come back, that's when you know you're in the bear market. And it's like, it's like, oh, you know, we don't like crypto tokens. You know, we just like blockchain. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Now it's probably the accumulation phase, right? Um, yeah. So, the, you know, it is interesting. I mean, I swear we will see it. Trust me, we will see yeah. it. Well, we we actually had some yeah yeah we had some guests on the show the other day that thought um who who I really like by the way um but one of their predictions is that every company will end up taking their uh, every SaaS company will end up taking their API and turning it into their own layer two basically and having these like kind of private L twos like forked L twos which is kind of feels like an extension of the enterprise blockchain mm -hmm. thesis exotic so. prediction we'll see how it plays out so I I think um you know. Broadly to me, um, you know, it, like the launch of Ethereum in 2015 and then like the ensuing stuff that started getting built there really like built us out of that bear market, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, I think that DeFi and smart contracts on Ethereum sort of built us out of the 2018 um, bear market. And so I think that's that's really um, the the next step is like we need you know to always support our entrepreneurs um, that really are the core of everything in crypto um, that are taking on these these radical experiments, may, most of which will fail, um, but some of which will succeed, and yeah. um, 
we need to build our way out. I mean, that's like how this has always worked um, to me. I mean, it, and also like the, it, this is, I, in my opinion, Coinbase built us out of the 2012 uh, bear market. It sort of like added this new ability to get capital into the system um, that didn't exist before. It was super hard to buy Bitcoin before Coinbase. Like, I mean, now it's easy with so many different platforms, but at the time it was like a nightmare to buy Bitcoin. And it's like, if you wanted to buy, you know, $100,000 of Bitcoin, it was like impossible. I mean, it was very, very, very hard um, and very scary sort of. Um, so now, you know, we just have to build our way out. That's how it's always been. Yeah. Um, Olaf, does it make you, so the other day, Richard from Numerai posted this thing on Twitter saying that he's out of Ethereum. He got in in the, in the sale, he got it at 26 cents, and now at 2,500 bucks, he's selling all of his Ethereum. And the reason, if you watch the video, I don't know if you did, but he said, now crypto is just tied to global macro. And that makes it much, much, much less interesting to him. And I know you mentioned, uh, that's one of your things now is for the first time ever, crypto is tied to global macro. Does that make crypto just as an asset class less interesting to you? Well, it's, it's you know, I think part of the subtext and R Richard's a good friend of mine and, and I, I really respect his thinking. Um, I think one of the subtexts though was like, you know, I'm up 1000 X. I probably am not going to go up another 1000 X in the next five years. Like I, yeah, he did all know, right. Which I think is, mm -hmm. um, our what he's actually he was actually up ten thousand x I guess ten thousand yeah he's yeah, up ten thousand yeah, yeah. x um, in five years or, or or seven years I guess and I I do think there was some subtext that was like okay I don't think that back return profile is going to carry on into the future um, and I think that's perfectly appropriate for to say right like I you know I I don't think Ethereum will ten thousand x over like the next you know, that would be like all the capital in the world. So I think, um, you know, that was, I think, some of the subtext. Um, I do think there's more correlation to, to global macro, but I think it is asymmetric on the upside um, for sure. Like, I just don't think you can invest in the S&P 500 and get the type of upside you get in crypto at all. Like, you know, even over the next, the next three to five years, um, I, I still think crypto is is relatively speaking small, misunderstood, um, and by many considered, you know, still like a, a, a scam or, um, you know, used for illicit activities. It's all it's all the same um, counter narratives that we've dealt with for for a decade. Um, but I think that, you know, the the asymmetric returns on the upside are significant compared to other asset classes, even if they're somewhat correlated. We interrupt your programming with a special announcement. Empire has a new sponsor. Santi and I are very excited to welcome BitMEX. That is right. BitMEX is back. The exchange we all know and love is back and better than ever. We're going to be dropping a couple updates on BitMEX over the next couple of months. This first one is a big one. Coming soon, BitMEX is rolling out their spot exchange and they're giving away $500,000 in Bitcoin to new users. That's right. Listening to Empire has got the alpha. Santi and I got you $500,000 in Bitcoin going to new users. For the OGs, I don't think I need to tell you why you need to use BitMEX. It's a love of the game kind of thing. You respect crypto, you use BitMEX. For those newer to the in uh, industry, BitMEX has a long and great history of innovation since their launch in 2014. They created perps and a whole lot more. Now they're back, they're better than ever, they're making waves. So what do you need to do? Go sign up for the BitMEX Spot Exchange for a chance to win some of the $500,000 in Bitcoin that BitMEX is giving away. B-I-T-M-E-X, B-I-T-M-E-X.com, that's BitMEX.com. Go make it happen. Now let's get back to the show. I'd be, I'd be curious, uh, you know, to get your perspective as well, like obviously, it, you know, history rhymes, uh, but it's not the exact same, uh, or it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Um, so, you know, there are some pretty legitimate, at least from my, you know, we, Jason and I came in in, in 2017, we also marked the top. We co-founded Blockworks, I think within a month of the all-time high and then watched it fall <laughs> for, for two months after, or two years after. Uh, but, you know, back then I remember, um, you know, people were kind of questioning yeah, maybe it's this idea that maybe Bitcoin is the only, that's the only legitimate thing. So it sounds like in 2014, 2015, people were like, is Bitcoin even going to work? Or like, what else is kind of the way forward? And 
in the, in the 2017, 2018 bear market, it was like, all right, Bitcoin and probably Ethereum. And what it feels like now, right, is, okay, some of these scam projects weren't going to work, but it feels like Bitcoin and Ethereum are very kind of solidly, you know, encased. Um, it seems like people genuinely believe in a multi-chain future. And while there was definitely a lot of like hype and speculation around NFTs and DAOs, and I want to get your thoughts on like governance versus tokenomics kind of going forward and just value accrual. But like what what feels different this time, uh, you know, potentially going into the bear market? Like, do you think these ideas are like enshrined and definitely going to work? Like, do you feel like, uh, yeah, I guess what, what do you feel like is different coming out of this one versus previous bear markets? It's, it's mostly that um, the sheer magnitude of experiments being run right now is it's massive. It's like unfathomable mm -hmm. in the number of like obscure startups that raised a few million dollars over the past 18 months is is crazy. So I I just think that um, the capital available, if you find something that it hits is it's pretty insane in crypto. Like if you have a project and it actually has product market fit and it's actually growing and stuff in crypto, when it works, it tends to grow really fast. Um, the amount of capital available to fuel that is 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 pretty unfathomable, um, and you know just the number of kind of fringe experiments being run is is massive. It's like way bigger than it was um, in in say 2018. You know, I think in 2018 I could still keep track of you know basically every individual project in crypto. It was hard, but I was, you know, obviously doing this on a full-time plus capacity. Um, but I could basically keep track of every single thing that was happening. Um, that is completely impossible now. Like, I am lucky if I keep track of 10% of, like, the total um, quantity of what's happening. So I just think that the entrepreneurial laboratory is bigger here than, you know, I, I wasn't around in – you know, 90s, early 2000s internet as an investor, but it, it's, I think it's got to be one of the biggest entrepreneurial laboratories in history, if not the biggest. Um, so I just have a lot of confidence that smart people out of that burbling chaos will build amazing things. Um, but you sort of have to have that faith. I mean, stuff like Ethereum, especially really came out of nowhere, right? Um, you know, there had been these previous attempts to build what were basically smart contracts or more, more complex logic into blockchain systems. And Ethereum just, um, you know, it, it worked. And um, it, it kind of saved the, the whole industry in a weird way. Um, at least that's my perspective on it. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that I've continually um, been impressed by the ability for our entrepreneurs to build like incredible new things in crypto. Yeah. Before, um, just one last question before getting into kind of, I know Mike wants to get into just multi-chain future and where value accrues, but one last question is, um, it still feels like maybe we haven't felt max pain. I know we are in the bear market right now and we're, you know, six, probably six months into it and probably little ways to go. But in 2020, even with BitConnect and the slow drudge down in 2018, 2019, max pain really wasn't felt until March of 2020. So when you look to start buying and accumulating things that you really like and, and backing entrepreneurs that you really want to back in the liquid markets, what signals are you looking for, Olaf? Like, are you starting, are you seeing the markets right now? And you're like, boom, great, huge buying opportunity. Are you like, no, 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 no. Like, this is not max pain yet. No, huge buying opportunity. I mean, I, I, I like, I don't know when max pain is, but <laughs> there's, you know, I don't need max pain. You know, I can just take reg regular pain. Regular pain. <laughs> regular pain. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah it's, I think... Like now begins obviously the era of of buying, not selling. Nice. Um, all right, I've got a, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, just about you know, I think the driving narrative, uh, if you had to ascribe one to twenty twenty one, was kind of this competition that was occurring on the layer one sort of smart contract layer, right? Um, and you had a bunch of different you know kind of viable. I get. I mean, some people get offended if I say, but viable competitors to Ethereum sort of emerge for the first time ever. Uh, that that had some pretty different trade-offs, right? So there's like kind of the Solanas, uh, right, which had their own kind of ecosystem. Then there are like EVM compatible smart chain or uh, 
smart contract chains like like the avalanches of the world in general. Um, I guess like at a, at a really high level, it's like such a simple question to ask, but like how do you see those kind of smart contract wars kind of playing out? Like how do they compete with each other? And then another question is, do you think we've seen the ones that are going to win? Like is it going to be some combination of maybe uh, like Ethereum, Solana, um, whatever, or do you see new competitors potentially coming out of the woodshed that don't even exist yet? Yeah, so um, I don't see it as like a zero sum game. Um, I, I really think that different platforms will lend themselves to different types of applications. Um, I mm -hmm. think we've already seen that with Ethereum and Bitcoin. A lot of people um, thought that was going to be sort of a war. What we've really seen is them coexist with alternative, alternate use cases, right? Um, and there's, you know, the fact that there's these irreconcilable trade-offs. Like the fact that Ethereum even has DeFi causes it to be, it's, it's harder to reason about core protocol um, matters. So you, you get things on Ethereum like minor extractable value um, and you get things in Ethereum 2.0 like DeFi yields competing with proof of stake yields. Um, that's, it's hard to reason about. It makes it complicated. Um, so that, you know, the simplicity of Bitcoin or reasoning about Bitcoin um, is, is kind of nice. What I mean to say is it's not that Ethereum is a superset of Bitcoin. It's an alternative project that has its own value proposition, you know, separate from Bitcoin. It, it's, to me, it's not like a zero sum competition. I similarly, I view a lot of these, you know, new blockchains, alternate, relatively speaking, newer, um, that are alternatives to Ethereum. Similarly, I, I don't think that this is like um, them versus Ethereum. I just think there's alternate architectures that make trade-offs and you get different types of applications or use cases or users that um, like those trade-offs. So, you know, if you care more about cost uh, than, than security, like there's a lot of easy trade-offs for you that are alternatives to Ethereum, where Ethereum, you know, is expensive to use. Um, and so I, I, I think that this experiment is going to last for many years. I, I don't think it's over at all. Um, I think stuff like, um, you know, optimistic rollups and the whole kind of layer two system ecosystem on Ethereum, we, we still really haven't seen emerge in a really big way. And I, I think we will see that. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of these bridging protocols. So you're going to be able to build multi-blockchain applications, move assets across blockchains. Um, I think it's all getting like more complex, not less. And I think there's going to be both existing projects that, you know, stand the test of time. And there's going to be new projects that none of us have ever heard of that emerge. So it's, I know that's a hand wavy answer, but it's, um, I don't think there's any like clarity um, at this point. I think it's, it's complicated and still like, a, I think it's still happening very much. So in, in the future, I mean, maybe like focusing in on Ethereum scaling roadmap in general is kind of the future that you envision, uh, like there are successfully kind of these layer two protocols that get rolled out. And in the future, when apps launch, they'll launch onto the layer twos. Um, and the reason I'm asking that question is like when, you know, uh, Board Ape Yacht Club did their land sale, I'm blanking on the name of whatever their metaverse land Other was. Side. Um, thanks. Uh, you know, that was, you know, caused an enormous amount of congestion on, uh, you know, the Ethereum main chain. And then, uh, and then basically they said they're going to come out and create their own chain. So I guess my, my question to you is when you see, you know, new projects in the future, are they going to be launching on layer twos? Are they going to be creating their own chains? Um, or is it going to be some combination of the two of those things? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, if you're an Ethereum app developer and we get um, you know, substantial users onto, for example, Arbitrum, why would you, you know, launch on the base chain instead of Arbitrum? Um, you really should just probably launch an Arbitrum. Um, so I, um, you know, I think, yeah, you're going to see app developers migrate to, to layer two systems for sure. Um, I also think that the applications that get big enough will in certain cases want to build their own sovereign chain. Um, mm. I, you know, I don't think it's every application because 
composability is very, very important in crypto. Um, so you, you know, if you had flash loans, just as a basic example, on its own chain, it would sort of render it useless, right? The kind of the point of a flash loan is to use the flash loan to go interact with another application. Um, so it's, you know, you can't silo out every single app. Um, but I think in certain cases, you are going to see this migration from like smart contract system to, you know, sovereign chain with its own logic. Um, so, you know, and it's, I think it's not super clear what class of applications that will be. Um, but I, I do think you will see it happen. And I think it can make sense in a lot of cases. And, um, you know, do you see for some of these layer twos, even like the, the ones that have been traditionally extremely associated with Ethereum, right? Like Optimism or Arbitrum, um, you know, eventually, right, I guess if these other layer ones like the Solanas and Avalanches are successful, then their block space will fill up and they'll also need to go to a layer two, right, on top of that. Like, do you think that there's a chance that some of these projects that people traditionally identify as like extensions of Ethereum almost, will they, do you think, do you see a world where they will actually integrate with other uh, layer ones? Where, yeah, where layer two systems like move across layer ones. Yeah. Yeah. I've always, you know, I've kind of always said, I think layer twos are basically a mechanism to launch a new layer one, but with really good UX, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. That's like broad based my view on it. Um, because, you know, you just really, really tightly integrate to an existing L1. Um, in this case, you know, Ethereum. Um, but then over time, you have your own app developer ecosystem um, of people deploying there. And then you start to think, well, wait a second, you know, couldn't couldn't we add similar security to an alternative blockchain, you know, that's EVM compatible, like an avalanche or something. Um, hmm. And then, you know, all of a sudden it starts to feel like, wait a second, what's the difference between this and just a chain that has a bunch of bridges to it? Um, you know, I think they're all likely to launch their own token, um, you know, and there you go. I mean, it's, I, I just think that it's interesting to me in the Ethereum ecosystem, um, there's a, you know, a certain subset of people that sort of are very much rooting against alternative, uh, layer one systems like say Solana or, or Avalanche, um, or, or Binance chain, you know. But they are rooting for um, optimistic rollup systems and layer twos, and sort of view those as like friendly to Ethereum. Um, I think that's the wrong framing. Uh, you know, it's mm. every the, these layer two systems are just really, really tightly integrated to Ethereum in order to better extract assets. Like, and I don't view it. I to use the word extract is like pretty intense, but um, it it really is just really, really good bridge UX. Um, to better pull over application developers. Um, it gets, you know, the, the light mode is like Avalanche EVM compatibility. So it's really easy to build bridges, really easy to integrate into existing UX systems like MetaMask, et cetera. And then like the, that's like light mode. And then, you know, heavy mode is like, we're literally inside Ethereum. You know what I mean? Um, mm. And so, yeah, I think it, you know, I think these optimistic rollup systems will be very successful. Um, and, you know, I think that people often think about, they, they become sovereign chains. Like, I think that's long-term what's going to happen. Well, so, Olaf, how does, so let's extrapolate this out a couple of years. So let's say all these optimists, the roll the rollups end up working and let's say some of the other L1s, like the Nears and the Avalanches and the Solanas end up working too. How do you think about, as an investor, how do you think about allocating capital into that kind of world and thinking about really like where the value in this world accrues? Yeah. So I think that um, in the past in crypto, it's it's been relatively easy to say, I am just going to speculate on the coin that has users. So wherever the users go and the application developers go, I'll just buy that coin. Um, the problem is that, you know, a lot of times there isn't necessarily a value accrual mechanism based on the number of users or application developers or transactions. As in, there, there is no real reason per se that that should drive value to the coin, other than an expectation that other people are thinking like you and speculating on the value. So 
now though you see this world you know um post eip 1559 um in ethereum where you know more transactions more smart contract activity actually burns ether um i think that is a critical turning point for thinking about value accrual in these systems i think it's going to be necessary to have that sort of system you know a kind of real like a burn type system embedded inside all of these these chains um and then that will become much more heavily um impactful on how to think about value over the long term i i think that it will become less about um speculation um and more about those kind of like real value accrual mechanisms um a more um, yeah this more mechanistic um value accrual to the underlying asset so i think the systems that you know do upgrades like that or incorporate that into their architecture are um on track i think you you need to be now as a as a layer 1 developer you need to be thinking about how does that um how do we drive demand based on transactional volume inside my system yeah i mean that's it's it's just kind of interesting to i mean how do you think about let's say the relative amount of economic activity that occurs between a layer 2 and a layer 1 let's say a relatively simplistic world of where like there's one layer 2 like on ethereum and then there's ethereum itself and the vast majority of economic activity per se because just so much transactions are so much cheaper on the l2 all of the apps and users kind of live in and use that ecosystem but ultimately it's still very dependent on ethereum the main chain right because all those transactions settle to that chain so like how would you think about in and maybe you just answered this and I, I just didn't understand it but like how would you think about the relative value then of a token uh you know the layer 2 token versus the eth token and does it have less to do with the amount of relative economic activity that's occurring at each layer versus some of that that value accrual mechanism that you were talking about like the relative supply of the asset like some mm-hmm. kind of burn thing yeah i mean i it's it's complicated because i still think we're mostly in the paradigm of um you know speculation rather than mechanistic value accrual if you mm-hmm. want to divide it that way um and i think we're like dramatically still in that paradigm as in it's probably like 95% the, the, you know not mechanistic value accrual in the way the average person is thinking about these assets um but as it does get more um complex in that there's lots of platforms assets move across platforms you can use bitcoin in defi etc um i think it gets more complicated and more and more people over time especially like institutionals are going to more and more start to think about that mechanistic value accrual so i do think that's sort of the way this goes longer term but we're not there yet mm. oh if it feels like all eyes m- most guests who come on the show end up saying two things that they're looking at are like roll ups and l2s uh, maybe three things are rollups and L2s and then uh, other L1s and like expansion of different ecosystems and bridges. What do you think is kind of the most underlooked thing where it kind of boggles your mind that that other folks aren't, aren't talking about X, Y, Z more? Yeah. You know, now there's so many people talking about so much stuff in crypto. It's <laughs> it feels like everything is covered, you know. Do you, uh, do, you, do, you do you miss the early days, Olaf? <laughs> Well, are you reminiscent ever? <laughs> simpler times for sure. Yeah. It's like, you know, once a week, like a new project dropped, you know, and you sort of read about it and then get back to work trying to scale Coinbase. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was easier. It was easier for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just think um, I really like these kind of more exotic experiments always where it's just sort of us unproven. Um so a couple categories that I think are just interesting and I I don't see people talking about um you know there's there's this concept of of like could we use um a proof mechanism like proof of work um to to do something else other than validation um of transactions in the system um so for example could we use that proof system to like train a machine learning algorithm right where all of the miners are doing this sort of useful work uh towards training a machine learning algorithm um there's one project doing that that i i think is is pretty fascinating 
Um, and it's just like a new category, right? Unproven, um, but it's, it's fascinating. If it did work, you know, as the coin price of that system goes up, you get a stronger and stronger and stronger AI, basically, um, which, is, which is very cool. The second, you know, another category that comes to mind is, um, you know, this concept of like a, a digital creator. So um, if you're familiar with like Lil Michaela, um, yeah, there's yeah. this, it's like, she's an Instagram star, but she's completely digital. Like there's, there's no real person there. Um, or you could think of like the band gorillas, right. Where like, it's all kind of animated and digital, um, thinking about like, how could you have that be a DAO ownership structure? So, um, when you look at, you know, meat space stars, like, um, a Kanye West, you can't like buy shares or ownership units of Kanye West. Right. Um, however, with like a little Michaela, you really could like you could really have a, a DAO that like owns that, you know, digital asset. Um, and then little Michaela could release music or release um, NFTs right. or like do things. And one of the nice things about that is they can perform in like 100 cities every night of the year. Right. Or they can they never go to sleep. Um, they never like slap somebody at the Oscars or like, <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, oh, oh like, can, I, can I actually push back on that one idea for a second? Which is which yeah. really what you're talking about is kind of like social tokens, like the ability to get upside in a creator, essentially, I would say. This is different because the creator is a fake person. Um, so it's like, I think that there's problem, like I think the main problem with social token, the idea that like, I'm gonna fund my college by selling 10% of my future earnings, right? That's like the classic social token experiment. Right, right. I just think you run into some pretty dicey area there um, that, you know, I think it's kind of obvious the ways that could go wrong or feel kind of weird. Um, yeah, well, well, any 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 sort of token or anything that gets traded on a marketplace, you will eventually will be able to go short on that thing. And what happens if I, a lot of people are buying Olaf tokens, well, I just load it up on a short position on Olaf, and now I'm pretty incentivized to see you fail. That gets pretty ugly pretty yeah, quickly. It gets, but I guess I see what, yeah. Yeah, like you don't want to accidentally make markets prediction markets. Um, right. Where yeah. you're incentivized to actually influence the outcome. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think that, you know, um, in the case of like a Lil Michaela, say, um, it's cool because you, you really can distribute um, ownership and build a community around that, those digital assets without, um, you know, any of those weird ethical problems basically that come from like selling shares of, of a person or something like that. Um, yeah. So I, I like, that's just another experiment that comes to mind. Um, you know, there's, there's stuff like this happening where it's, it's small today, but um, if one of these things works, you know, maybe, it, maybe it's very big tomorrow. Yeah. Speaking of DAOs, Olaf, um, I've obviously heard you on a bunch of different shows and podcasts just talking. It seems like you're quite optimistic about where DAOs go in the future. Could you ever turn your fund, the entire firm into a DAO? Is that something that's on the roadmap? Um, you know, I, I think that would be pretty cool. Um, if it weren't for, <laughs> um, if it weren't for like all, you know, laws and, and regulation around that. So, yeah, you know, conceptually, I think, um, DAOs in my mind, they really only need to get one thing right, um, which is capital allocation, um, and the governance process around that capital allocation. So I do think DAOs are sort of like, um, limited partners in funds, like they should, be investing in managers. They should be investing in in startups. Um, I don't think they should actually be doing anything as in operating. I think all they should be doing is allocating capital and perfecting the governance process to allocate that capital. You're saying you're saying all DAOs or venture DAOs? I'm I mean like all DAOs. All DAOs should just be allocating capital. Well, and, and I'm out talking about DAOs down. that are at scale. If you want to build like a little neighborhood DAO, that's like a different. Thing. But no, but like like yeah. uh, like what Maker has set up basically, where they allocate capital to different teams, yeah. Like and or like uh, you know these DAOs that have really collected like hundreds of millions of dollars um, from sponsoring DeFi protocols. Um, I don't think that they should, you know, the the level of zoom on DAOs right now is like way too zoomed in. 
way too zoomed in, yeah. in my opinion. So like you get these votes on like an individual developer salary, you know, it's, that is insane. It's like going to the board of a company, a publicly traded company board to say like, what should this one engineer get paid? Mike and I were reading the forum for, I forget which DAO it was, but it was, um, oh my God, they were voting on something at, that happened at the offsite. They were like, should we spend a day at the lake at our company, at our offsite? Mm -hmm. And there were like 12 people at the offsite and you had like 200 people voting on this thing. And people are like, why are people spending time at a lake at the offsite? And I was like, oh my God. This that's is a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. just, it's, it's the, like all the DAO should do is allocate capital. Like I think the DAO yeah. needs to be separated from the startup, so to speak. I think the startup yeah. should just be like CEO, entrepreneur, um, you know, top down, decision making, execution, et cetera. Um, and the DAO is just the capital provider that, you know, gets to decide if that entrepreneur is executing or not um, or has a good strategy or not. So I, I think that if you can reduce DAOs to capital allocation, um, I think they can be highly, highly effective. I think a lot of the problems with DAOs is they're trying to do stuff instead of just allocate capital today. Yeah. Do you think that a lot of the companies like, okay, so you spend a lot of time at Coinbase. When I look at Coinbase right now, um, I actually have multiple questions about Coinbase, but Coinbase goes up against someone like Uniswap. I'm going to make these numbers up, but Coinbase has something like 4,000 or 5,000 employees. Uniswap has like 50 employees. And again, super rough numbers. Does someone like, can, can a centralized company, like one of these quote unquote CFI companies, like a BlockFi versus an Aave or Coinbase versus Uniswap, over time, can the CFI companies compete with some of these DAOs? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the DeFi, DeFi systems win in the end. Um, yeah. However, DeFi systems cannot integrate with traditional banks. So the bridges will always be owned. And by, by bridge, I mean fiat to crypto bridge. The fiat to crypto bridge will always be owned by, by centralized exchanges. Like that, that you have to have a centralized exchange. It, there's no other way. Um, yeah. However, the order books, um, I think long term, um, are, are won by DeFi. So it's mm -hmm. it's like if you just want to trade crypto for crypto, that long term is going to be at DeFi. Um, but if you want to, you know, exchange a hundred dollars in your bank account for crypto, that's always going to be a Coinbase like business. Olaf, are you still close with Brian? Yes. Got to empathize for the guy right now. I was telling Mike, I was like, man, it would suck to be the CEO of a public company. <laughs> I was like, he's got this great yeah. business. I love Coinbase. I use Coinbase all <laughs> the time. Too. I'm like, yeah, man, I yeah, like. Got to suck to be a CEO of a public company. I don't know if you've talked to him about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I think um, it's 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 just... Scary. Did he have hair before starting Coinbase, <laughs> basically? Uh, that's what I'm asking. Uh, no, he was, he's always had the same same haircut, for sure. Um, I, right. I think that it's just hard being the CEO of any company um, because its success or failure is, is kind of on your shoulders. Um, I mean, you know, Coinbase... Um, really it went through the gauntlet in, in 2014, 15. I mean, it was, it was hard. Um, it's just this thing where you're hiring people, you kind of have this, this great company concept, you know, all these new product ideas. Um, but like revenue was just dropping, Oh, you know, every month it was just like, okay, fewer and fewer and fewer people using the system. Um, and you get to the point where you're like, wait a second, you know, are we like suddenly rethinking product market fit? You know what I mean? Yeah. I thought yeah. we like figured it out and we're in this like growth phase. You know what I mean? Um, and that's very hard as a startup when you're in a cyclical industry is like, um, you know, what is, um, what is growth like of a real product market fit product? And what is like, you sort of accidentally rode the macro wave a little bit, but you actually yeah. didn't have any product. Yet. I, I remember reading uh, the, the, one of Brian's pieces in 2017 when the servers were shutting down. And he's like, guys, you got to understand, like 18 months ago, he's like, we were not prepared for this. And I will admit that because 18 <laughs> months ago, we were like still trying to like, we were running on a hamster wheel. So, yeah. so I, you know, yeah. I think I'm just really sympathetic to um, everyone that's in like an entrepreneurial journey. I think that it's, yeah. I think it's kind of sad in a way that, um, you know, our society's, you know, most successful entrepreneurs are, are, are vilified 
Um, and I don't think anybody really comprehends how difficult it is um, to be an entrepreneur psychologically. You know, um, you really have everything riding on, on your shoulders. Um, it all comes down to you. And like so many different people depend on you. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, like it's, um, you know, the people who are very successful entrepreneurs, they bring up so many people with them, you know. Um, so many employees, um, so many investors, like they, you know, um, but the, the reverse is true as well, right? If it fails, you feel like you didn't just fail yourself. You failed everybody. Um, so I just think it's, it's very intense and I have a lot of respect for people, um, that can handle being an entrepreneur. And I think that as a society, um, it's probably time for us to re-examine the way that we think about entrepreneurs because somehow they became like bond villains um when in reality i think they are very important um to everything that mm. that you know is happening and as i talked about with like the entrepreneurial laboratory that is like the tip of the spear for society on how we solve things like i yeah. really do believe in the entrepreneurial laboratory too solve problems that at really global scale um and in the most serious categories i could not agree with you more olaf on all of that yeah hmm. olaf maybe to maybe to close um you know just at, at like a high level you kind of talked about um you know real problems getting solved during bear markets right and that's been i think jason my experience too so what were a couple of the things maybe it's like DAO governance, maybe it's this idea of yield farming and just giving out essentially network equity for free, right, to mercenaries, like whatever it is, like what are a couple of the things that you think really need to be fixed or like got taken to extremes in the last bull market? Um, and then at a higher level, like, you know, just having gone through crypto for as long as you have, there's so many overriding narratives, right? There's like the democratization of finance, there's the replacing of the reserve currency of the US. Like, where do you think, are there any of those narratives that you think are popularly accepted that you personally don't believe in? I'd be curious, like where you land on some of those. So, um, yeah, one, one like macro thing that I'm surprised more people haven't talked about um, is that in, in 2014, we had the, the sort of launch of altcoins um, that had some sort of like pre-mine mechanism. So some of the coins were, were held by the creator. Um, in 2017, we had ICOs and this kind of crowdfunding phenomena. And in 2021, we got NFT mints, okay? And the, the kind of financial mechanism underlying all three of those is identical. It's identical. It's like um, the creator holds some coins and then there's basically a crowdfunding, you know, event that pushes capital into the system. Um, and, you know, the creator owns a portion from, from the beginning. Um, and it's kind of different form factors. Like, you know, it was base chains. It was, um, you know, ICO projects and now at NFT mints. But I think that it's very tightly rhyming history, right? Um, and I do think like a lot of the confusion from new entrants in crypto is that just because something has this like cool financialization, it doesn't mean that there's anything underneath that. Um, so a lot of the, you know, in, in the ICO wave, it was sort of like, you know, I'm doing the ICO because it's an ICO. Like ICOs are just a cool thing in general. So like, you know, and then I feel like that happened with NFT mints. It was like, I'm just doing the mint because like, holy shit, I heard about it on Discord and like, you know, it's like, it's a mint. I have to do it. You know what I mean? So I, I like, I think that um, there's a lot of like, you know, I, I think something I didn't like about this 2021 thing was this concept that like, we're all going to make it. Um and it, it's sort of like the problem is that it's like we're all going to make it no matter what. And the reality is it does, you know, the world's not that simple. And you actually need to do useful things and um, create value for other people to make it. Like you can't um, just like ride this macro wave forever. Um, and it's, it's not actually like up only as and it shouldn't be. Like we actually have to prove ourselves 
um, to the world. Like as a crypto industry, like it is our job to show the world that this is useful. Um, we can't just like, you know, we we almost can, but we can't just meme our way to, to the top, you know. <laughs> That's an important component of it because this is social technology. Um, but we really do have to build useful stuff for people and make it work. Um, so I, you know, I'm excited to get back to the um, era of just sort of like actually what's being built, not just, you know, everything goes up um, for no reason. Yeah. Olaf, this has been awesome. Man. I appreciate it on such a crazy day and a crazy week. I pre really appreciate it all the time. And this has been a fantastic conversation. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. We'll see you later.